What is going on, everybody? Guys, it is wicked, wicked, wicked to be back. It, uh, well, this is David Greenspan, and you are back with us for another show live. What is going on, everybody? All new season three of the Mindshare Podcast. A proud member of the Industry Syndicate Media Network. Additional podcasts are available at MindShare101.com and on all the major podcast platforms. This week's episode is sponsored by the Buzz Conference and Kits Keep In Touch Systems. Now, make sure you connect with the Buzz Conference by visiting their website, www.thebuzzconference.com, or by following them on Instagram, at the Buzz Conference to keep tabs on all the awesome events that they are always hosting. And Kits is also with us, of course. Kits offers a fully loaded cross-channel marketing suite for the real estate industry, including tools to help you manage your business, build that mindshare, and drive even more sales. You can learn more on my site, mindshare101.com, by clicking on marketing. Now, as you know, you must know if you're tuning into the show regularly, our push to 100 reviews on iTunes is on. And so I would like to ask you, if you haven't yet, please, Take two minutes, go to iTunes, leave a big five-star review, rate the show, tell us how much you love it, tell everybody how much you love it. Um, It really is that easy. And uh, once again, thank you sincerely in advance for that. Today's episode is number 136. She's a Toronto real estate broker owner of Roy LePage, Terra Equity, Rena Matter Realty, and former host of the popular HGTV shows, Property Versions, and By Herself. She has over 25 years of experience in one of the toughest markets in Canada. She has worked with hundreds of clients, many of them single women, and understands the importance of first, knowing yourself well, setting goals, remaining flexible, and keeping the goal of home ownership front and center in your thinking. She says... I've had to overcome some of my own deep-rooted objections in life before I could allow myself to dream and to live my true self. In my book, Home Worthy, I use real stories from my own life as well as stories of how other women have dealt with their false beliefs in order to succeed in buying their homes. I want women to know that they were born worthy and show them how they can get what they deeply want in life. She's the proud recipient of the coveted Stevie Award for Women in Business and a multitude of real estate awards. She's appeared as a real estate expert on The View, The Marilyn Dennis Show, CNN, Global TV, BNN, CTV, and more. And she feels that everyone can contribute in some way to the important issues in the community and enjoys participating in many charities, including health and organizations that aim to improve quality of life for women and animals. This week on the show... I am joined by Sandra Renomato. Sandra, welcome to the Mindshare Podcast. Hey, David. How are you? I am doing amazing. Thank you. I'm awesome. excited to have you here today. Uh, you know what? Thanks for having me. It's great to be Absolutely. here. I always love talking to you. I know, 100%. Hey, it's been a little while. It's been a little while, but uh, you know, it's uh, we've got a we've got a great show lined up today. Um, I was really, really excited to receive that book you sent me uh, a couple of weeks ago. Thank you. Seriously, um, had a good look through that. And, and, you know, I got to tell you, I truly enjoyed it. Like I was looking through a lot of the points that you talk about, and I want to encourage everybody here um, and we'll, we'll, we'll share more about, you know, the, with the link and where you can pick it up. But um, there was so much that I resonated with in that book. And I think that it would be a powerful read for a lot of people that are tuned in right now. Um, so let's start on that front, actually, you know, share more with us. Tell like, what, what's the book all about and why did you decide to write it? You're a successful real estate agent with all these other hats on writing a book. Where, where'd you find the time even? <laughs> you know what? It was, I'm so glad I took the time to do this, David, because as I was doing my research and understanding more, it was self-help for me. And I just gained so much more clarity. So I really do hope that it is a powerful read for people because that was the intention. The intention was, you know, it wasn't to make a million bucks. I mean, unless you're JK Rawlings, you don't make a million bucks off of books, I'm told. But um, this is what happened. So, you know, I've been a real estate agent for a long time, right? So I love working with women. I was a single woman buying my own property after my first, after my divorce. And you know what? I didn't have any qualms about it. Maybe because I had gone through the worst real estate decline. You know, we went into Canada, went into a, um, a recession and I actually lost money on real estate, which is like early nineties. Yeah. Like yeah. Back then. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. And my interest rate was 
like my interest rate was like 13 and three quarters percent. It was a nightmare, right? So I'd been like gone through the gamut. And so I wasn't afraid. So it never dawned on me to have fears about buying property just alone. It just never did. What I did was made sure that I could afford the property no matter what. I mean, I was a realtor then. So it was, you know, you're paid by commission. You're not guaranteed a weekly paycheck. So I made sure I could get money from an auxiliary apartment in there. So when I started working with women, and I love, love, love this statistic, almost one in four home buyers in Canada is a woman buying on her own, which is brilliant. That is massive sociological change. Like 50 years ago, a woman couldn't get a, a, a credit card on her own without a male co-signer. So look at the difference. Now women are, you know, getting mortgages and buying properties or paying cash, however they're doing it. Now people go, so big deal. So 25% are, you know, women, The other, maybe 50% are families or couples and the other 25 are men. No, only 10% are single men buying on their own. So I found that statistic to be, yeah, super interesting. And that's when I pitched it to HGTV Canada and we had the show by herself um, about this. Ah, so this, that was your brainchild. You actually went to them and yeah. said, Hey, I got this idea. Yeah. And, and they loved it. And, and so we did the show. Um, so what happened working with women buying real estate? And, you know, I hate to generalize, but the, these situations actually happened repeatedly. Mm -hmm. Um, I like to say there are three categories of women, women who, you know, never have it on their radar that they should become independent or create their own destiny or, you know, consider buying property. The second group of women who are starting to think about it, kick around the idea, do some research, um, you know, and, and start toying with the idea. Should I? Could I? What would happen if I did? And then the third group of women are the women who have spent the time researching, saving their money for a down payment. Now they're ready to go. Um, so I had a couple of women like in a row that were in that top category that they were ready to go. These women had saved a lot of money. I'm talking 200 grand after tax dollars. Like that's not easy when you're living mm -hmm. in Toronto. Absolutely. I don't care who you are. <laughs> so, um, they had been planning it for a long time. They had done their research. We met, I like to bring uh, buyers into the office to have a calm, relaxed conversation. This is what you can expect this is what you can expect from me and so on. They like, you know, knocked it out of the park. They were, I, I was so excited for them. I was like, wow, these women really have their, their act together. They're, this is awesome. And I remember the first one um, we worked together. And so she had limited her budget because I find that women are quite frugal and safety conscious, very cautious when it comes to spending the money on real estate, which is, you know, the opposite of the uh, stereotype about women. We can't control money and well, oh, the shopping thing and everything else. Yeah. You know, as you yeah. bring that up, I kind of think to myself, wait a second. No. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we sat down, we talked about it. What if I want to have a child? So, you know, this, she had decided she would get a condo. It would be, you know, affordable price. She was going to put and her mortgage would be affordable, property taxes, maintenance fees, all that stuff affordable. And we're going to get a den in case she does want to start a family. No problem. She could do all of this. And she knew roughly what location she wanted. So we started working. And right at that time, the location she started looking in, condos just exploded in value. And it was scenario similar to what we've gone through recently where, but this was several years ago. Um, it seemed like every week the prices were going up. So if you bought, you know, 508 on Monday, next Monday, 608 would be $5,000 more. Like we saw this happening. It took three months to find something. She wanted mm -hmm. something a little bit bigger than normal, a little bit outside the norm. So when we walked in, I was excited about this property. David, I see properties every day. Mm -hmm. When I get excited about a property, uh, right. you know, it's because there's something really good about it. It's like above average. And she could recognize that it was hitting everything on her checklist. So she started wigging out a little bit, right? She started freaking out yeah. because now, you know, we had pulled this rabbit out of the hat, you know, and she's like, oh, wow. She had offered on a couple of properties and lost. So she had raised her budget because it, it wasn't the bank that was saying you can only have this much. It was her keeping the, you know, because sometimes people, buyers of all sites, they focus on the big number. Like what is the price? And I mean, nobody wants to pay a million dollars. Nobody wants to pay a half a million dollars. So don't focus on that number, right, but- right. 
um, she had raised her budget a little bit, self-imposed budget. And I said, you know what, this is going to take all of that. You know, it's going to take your full budget because you can see it's bigger. It has this extraordinary feature. It's not easy to come by, blah, blah, blah. And it started to scare her. So she started asking questions uh, like, well, what if I have a baby? I'm like, okay, we talked about that. Like, you know, we talked about that. That's why we're looking at places with dens and you wanted this. And I was like very calmly reminding her of all the things we had talked about, the decisions that she had made when she was calm and rational and had time to think it through. But now she was pulling all that stuff out of the air. And then she went back and she went to her uh, sphere of influence, her circle, circle of influence, right? Mm -hmm. And she was asking questions. Now, here's where it gets really tricky, David. If I go as a daughter to one of my parents and I want to do this scary thing, sometimes the parent will still be in protector mode, no matter how old you are. <laughs> They're still in protector mode. So they have this little twinge of like, oh my gosh, what should I advise her? Uh, is, is this safe for her? Oh, my little girl could be, oh, my little girl's all grown up. Whatever it is, there's a little twinge of mm -hmm. energy that you pick up imperceptibly. You pick it up. And if you're looking for the answer, no, you might just perceive that as no. So whatever happened, she went to her circle of influence and she kept asking until she got the answer. She thought she wanted at that time, which was no. So she got a no. So she stopped. She did. She held back money and she lost it for three grand. Right oh. now. Yeah, I was I was heartbroken for her because we had found this sort of unicorn listing and, mm -hmm. and, you know, it could have been hers. It was well within her affordability, but she allowed her false beliefs and old, uh, old beliefs to stop her. She allowed her fear essentially to stop her. Now, tragically that year, those condos that she was looking at went up some crazy amount. I want to say 30%. Right. She could have made 132 grand oh. that year, tax-free dollars on your principal residence. Right. Wow. So, yeah, so heartbreaking because what happens is once you stop when you're at that level, you're you, you won't start again. Do you know what I mean? I totally understand what you're saying. Here's okay, so let me ask you a question on that then. And sorry to, to take it off of, of that story because but cool. on that, when we talk about home ownership, I mean, like you talk about a half a million and a million. Yeah, where, right? Like in our market today, it is even more than that. Yeah. To get not a lot anymore. And it's more yeah. money than most of us 20 years ago thought we'd ever spend on a piece of real estate. Mm -hmm. right? So as it's getting harder and harder to achieve home ownership, how important is it to be advising people about, you know, what we feel is right, what we feel is wrong, you know, what's a good move, what's a not a good move? Or, or, I mean, we've seen in this market that there's some people that just treat this as a job and kind of go, hey, listen, I'm here to help you buy and sell. I'm not here to, you know, tell you not to do anything or I'm not, I'm not really concerned about your long term. I'm just here to help you like get whatever it is you want. So let's just do this. So we look at like how hard it is to get home ownership and, and the role we play. What's the important part of that right there from our aspect? Should we just treat it like a job or do we really need to be thinking like bigger picture, longer term for people? And I've heard a lot of mixed reviews and I, I it's just, it's an interesting conversation around that. Right. Cause this yeah, is no, it's a great question. as well. It's a great question. Um, Personally, I'm too opinionated about real estate yeah. to let someone make a mistake, what I think is a mistake, without me presenting the data to them so that they can make an informed choice. I think our job as a realtor is to decipher the data, right? However, there are some clients that don't want my input. And I have to respect that. That's what they want or don't want. It's totally up to them. Most of the time, though, I find that buyers and sellers, they think they know what they need. They think they know what they want, but it's not necessarily going to pan out that way. It's not necessary that it's, it's actually unusual if something goes like tickety boo, buy the book. You know, it's not mm -hmm, a recipe mm -hmm, that you mm -hmm. just follow. I mean, there's all every situation is unique. The buyer's unique. The seller's unique. The agents are unique. The house is unique. The market conditions this moment are unique. So, you know, no two deals are identical, right? right? So there are uh, people who just want an agent to put a key in the door, sadly, just put a key in the door and answer a few questions. And if that's what they want, that's what 
we should give them. However, there are other ways, and you know this, David, there are other ways to present the information to them in a way that is not pushy, that is not, you should do this. It's just like illuminating things for them that they may be overlooking, right? Because everybody, everybody knows a little bit about real estate. And if you think of a pie graph, this is my favorite. If you think of a pie graph, a circle, there's a little sliver in there that is buyers or sellers know stuff about real estate. Then there's another sliver that's maybe two or three times the size of that one. And that's what they know they don't know, right? So that's why they come to a professional. <laughs> and the rest is what they don't know. What you don't know. <laughs> and this is with everything, not just real estate. When you hire a professional, yeah. you know, all yeah. the stuff you don't know, like you go to a lawyer, sure, you know the law, but you don't know the ins and outs, right? Yeah. That's yeah. why you yeah. get a good lawyer. Yeah. No, you know what I, and I think, I think what it is, is, is when we look at, again, the prices that are out there and the fact that people want to do an upgrade or a downgrade or whatever it is, the fact that they don't know what they don't know. Now it's this thing of, they're just going based on this whim, this, this thought, this, this moment in time. And I really do believe that responsibility does rely on us in some way, shape or form to present that data, to help them decipher that mm -hmm. data so that at least they make a good decision. Cause I, look, we want to talk sales, bottom line sales, like, Hey, this is longevity of our business. You do a good exactly. job for these people. You keep them more or less safe. You help advise them in the right way. What are they going to do? They're going to feel good. They're going to feel confident. They're going to tell people about you, period. If yeah. you go the other way and you're like, yeah, you got to go for it. Just do it. And you're sitting there going, how much am I making? This is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then it gets done. If they realize they made a mistake or something goes wrong or they're just not happy, where's the path of least resistance? It is your fault. But you know what, David, this, when you're dealing with people in any industry, it can be soul, soul wrenching, like soul destroying. It could destroy your soul, like the energy output. Oh yeah. Right. Oh yeah. So it's a lot. you've got to find joy in the job. Yeah. And hopefully the joy is to really do a good job for these people. And this you is where do I a say a good I'm, job and not just get paid. Yeah. Like, otherwise, you know what? It's just deal, deal. There's, you know, easier deals to do than this business. This there business is go. tough. Sorry, go. real estate is go. not an yeah. easy. Now, I'm not going to put the rose colored glasses on for anyone. So I tell so, brand new agents, like it is not an easy business. So unless you find the joy, you're not going to last. You want to just come in for three, four five years, take money from people. Then that's you as a human being. I don't, it's sad if that re is reflected on the entire in industry, because that's not the way it is for most people. Definitely not in my brokerage. I never would, that person wouldn't last in my brokerage. Everybody in my brokerage, for example, really cares. We call it the brokerage with heart yeah. because in my logo, there's a little heart, but uh, between the S and the R. But honestly, that is the, I learned that early on in the industry and I came from retail. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I had retail. Wow. My years in retail really prepared me for real estate with the people element because this is the business we're in. We're not selling brick and mortar. Yeah, we are. That's part of the business, but the real business is communication and relationships with people. And if you can do that, you know, it's such a brilliant life. The people love you. You go to bed at night, you look in the mirror and you go, you know what, Sandra, you did a good job today. And you go to bed with that, that smile on your face, feeling satisfied. You need to get satisfaction from, you need to get the satisfaction from the job. Okay, let's talk satisfaction here because in your book, you talk about goals. And yes. right when I read that, I'm like, oh, give it to me. I want to hear this stuff because I'm, 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 again, my audience knows this. I've told this story probably every single show. No, I mean, anytime goals comes up, but um, never one to used to set goals. That changed a number of years ago. And I've got now a long list of, of wicked jaw-dropping stories that you would go, really? And you're like, yeah, I just put it on a vision board. I set the goals and I like went at it and like, look, look, look. People are like, really? But you talk about setting goals. Um, you talk about finding your why, having a vision. Mm -hmm. um, from your side, I want to hear, like, tell us more about this. Like, why are you, and I could tell you why I, but I want to know why are you such a believer in all of this, you know, this, this sort of mantra of goal setting and, and, and you know, doing things. Um, and, and I guess, how can other people empower themselves with that same way of thinking? And how do we even tie this back to owning a home, buying a home, owning a home, whatever, like helping others own a home? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
So thank you for the question. And I, I do want to hear all your stories. Um, yeah, I, we have a good master- time for it. It's a long list. So I'll tell you set goals because it works. Well, manifesting, you're manifesting them, right? 100%. You are, so yeah. I never had goals when I was younger. And then when I got into real estate, I don't know, I did a business plan and, and, you know, you're an entrepreneur. I did a business plan and I started to see that, uh, you know, I, I tell this to my new agents too, like the half the year for me wasn't, uh, wasn't the end of June. Like, I don't want to make 50% of my goal in income goal by the end of June, like today, June 30th, but I do want to do 60%. Yep. So I would look at it and I would keep track. Right. And, um, Because, you know, when you're in the business, when you're working at the business, you're not necessarily focused on your cash flow or your income or the bills you have to pay. That's not a happy way to live. And that's not how you serve your client. Right. We've talked about this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every couple of months or whatever, I'd write down what I did and the transactions and stuff like that. And uh, if I was behind, all of a sudden stuff would happen. Good stuff. And like you say, when you focus on it, it starts to happen for you, right? Yep. So I've got story after story, but I've got this, I, I, I think I put it in the book too. I know I put it in the book. It's the Mario Andretti story. Did you hear that yep. one? Mm-hmm. So, so real quick story on this. I, uh, I love to this day, auto racing. So Mario Andretti was in my awareness since I was like five years old, okay? So in that time he was running, you know, he wasn't Formula One or IndyCar or anything at that time. He wasn't a champ yet. So um, always knew him, always loved racing, and he's an icon. He truly is an icon, a legend in the industry. Oh, so absolutely. I said to my one of my friends, um, we were talking one day, and I said, oh, yeah, I went on the racetrack. We rented this track, and we had these race cars out there. We were going around the racing. Oh, my gosh, it was so thrilling. I came off. My T-shirt was soaked, and I was shaking. I needed to eat a sandwich, and she's like, you like that? I'm like, do I like that? Are you kidding? If I could get into a race car on the same, just on the same track as Mario Andretti and do two laps, you could open the car door and shoot me dead. I would die a happy, satisfied one. <laughs> like, wow, you are whack. So she had no interest in racing. A year and a half later, she ends up in the race industry, working for a team in hospitality. She sets me up to go pick up Mario Andretti at the airport. Come on. Private jet. I drove him around in his golf cart around exhibition ground, CNE, um, to do autograph sessions and stuff like that. I sat down, had private conversations with him. The guy's so worldly. I was in the track. I was in the pit when the track was hot. It was a dream come true. Get this though. At the last minute I get offered to go into a pace car and I got in the pace car with Mario Andretti and we did two laps Come around on, the racetrack. That is he, he had retired from driving by then. Two laps in the pace car. And it wasn't till years later that it actually dawned on me that that conversation, and I said that to quite a few people, but that passion, that energy that I put into it to say that story and to really, really feel it, never ever thought it would come true. It came true. Now, here's the interesting thing, and you know this too. It doesn't net. It didn't look like what I had envisioned. I uh, thought I was yeah. going to be in an Indy car, right? And Mario yeah, Andretti yeah. be at the other end of the track, not even know I exist. I was in a pace car with Mario. That's crazy. That is wild. What a story. Right? So man. super cool story. All these kinds of, like you said, manifestation stories and, um, you know, goal setting is super important. But to start, you got to be aware of where you are where you are and then you got where you want to go where you want to go right because if you don't know where you want to go and i've said this to everybody like and i use this example all the time right and i'll I'll do it with you right now just for everybody that's tuned in but you know um can you come over right now no why i can't come to your house well in my house my could you come over like if time permitted would you be able to come over i could come over yeah okay cool do you you know where i am no how are you gonna get here (laughs) exactly okay so what if i give you the address could you come here Yes, I could. What if you've never been here before? How would you I would use here? my GPS. Perfect. That's exactly it, right? So I, I bring it together that simply and say, so you need to know where the address is if you actually want to get there. And I think everybody is probably going, yeah, makes sense. Okay, cool. So now that we got the address, but you've never been there before, how are you going to get there? Map yeah. that shit out. 
That's right. right. Map it out. Know exactly where you want to go. And now you're going to know to turn left. You're going to know to turn right. You know, you drive straight. Drive for this long. You'll get here. Just follow the rule. Just follow the directions. So what are the directions? Well, the directions are those small little baby steps you're going to take to actually get to that that destination. And some of it is just having the conversation like you you said. Some of it I'm going to say is seeing it and visualizing it. Like I did that to my wife on Saturday night. I said, you know, come up. I want to show you something. And I showed her our vision board. And there's a picture on the vision board of something. And I won't share it yet because I, I still got to make it sort of finalize it. But there's a picture up there of something. And I showed her the picture of the other thing I'm working on. And she went like, oh, my God. And to what you just said, it's not identical, but it is so close that you're like, yeah, th- those are the two. And she had done that to me three years ago, coming off a stage somewhere. We were sitting in an airport and she showed me a picture of me on stage with a lot of people in front. And then she showed me this picture we had on the vision board, which was something that she kind of concocted of like uh, graphics and putting it together to kind of go like, this will be it. She made that picture and then she somehow took that picture. I don't know. I can't explain it. I can just tell you if you put your head yes. down, focus, you can bring it to life. Now, totally can't different. can't explain it, but. You can't. You can't but wouldn't you rather wouldn't you rather try it? Oh my God, yeah. Right? What, just... what did I say to you? What did I say to you before? I wasn't that guy before. I know. I wasn't that guy. So I never it it didn't come to life the way you wanted it to. You and didn't you know you were a witch. You, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, here. Totally different topic. Um, so many people are scared to leverage video for their business. <laughs> and and they, you know, they don't like how they look, they don't like how they sound, you know, yet. I mean, and I bet many, in fact, probably most, in fact, maybe nobody. I don't know if anybody has as funny of a story as maybe you do when it comes to like, hey, just get over it. Um, this is show business. You remember that one? So <laughs> can you <laughs> can you tell us about uh, bad hair days and your first <laughs> audition when it came to television? I mean, and I want to f- find a takeaway moment from all of this, but I thought it was an amazing story. And I have to say, I was laughing just picturing when Gary was laughing. Oh my I was, god! I was reading the book, and you were explaining that. I'm like, I started chuckling. Like, oh, that would have must have been hilarious. <laughs> now, just just to bring it back for everybody that's tuned in, the idea here is I'm a, I'm asking Sanders to share, you know, about this comfort around video. But she, anyways, you've got the story. I'll let you go from there for a second. Yeah, yeah. Well, nobody, no, yeah, nobody loves the way they sound or hear you know sound or look on video i mean very few people right? right so uh yeah so they were coming to film me and i'm actually a very calm i'm excitable but i'm a calm person and in a crisis i'm usually extremely calm and i can figure out the solution to a problem however when there's a television crew involved and i've never been on tv before yeah all that goes out the window so here i am fixing my hair I had had a haircut and the, you know, the week before the stylist had done some really cute little flip. So I wanted to do this flip. So my hair looked really good. And I'm standing in my bathroom with just my bra and underwear on. And if uh, in this house that we were in at that time, if I stepped outside of my bathroom, you could see me from the front door. Front door was glass. There was a wooden door, but it was open. We always kept it open. So the glass door, so you could see me in my bra and underwear if I came out of the bathroom. So I'm doing my hair and you know, it looked pretty good, I have to say. And, uh, but my bangs were just like, they were 90%. They weren't quite a hundred percent. So I went into my little box of hair stuff that I had collected over the years. And I found this brush that I hadn't used in eons. So it was a skinny little brush about the size of my finger. And I rolled up my bangs real tight so that the brush is like sticking into my skin. And, um, I sprayed it with hairspray that you can hang wallpaper with that stuff, man, like totally. And, uh, and I took the hair dryer and I'm blowing it dry. Right. And I put the hair dryer down and I'm feeling really confident and I go to pull out the, well, the brush it's what? <clears throat> and I'm like, Oh my God, <clears throat> like this. Right. So now I'm sweating and, um, I could hear Gary downstairs talking to a client on the phone. And uh, we had an office down there and I, oh my God, oh my God, Gary helped me. So I'm like trying to pull out one hair at a time and I'm trying to get this brush out of my hair. And it's actually giving me a headache because it's like pushing right into my scalp. And, uh, and I'm like, okay, so I run over, okay, so past the glass door, run over to my laptop and I type an email to Gary because he's on the phone with a client. I don't want to interrupt him. So, and I don't have time to run downstairs. Like they're coming now. And I type- Camera an crew is on the way to your house. They're going to come any minute. Like if they were coming at one o'clock, it was two minutes to one now. 
just enough time to get dressed. So, uh, so I go to my laptop and I type, come to bathroom ASAP. Just subject line, no text, right? I don't know about you, but I probably wouldn't come running to the bathroom if somebody typed me that. Okay. Sorry, honey, didn't get that email. Well, that's what he did. <laughs> so I hear he's off the phone and and I'm still trying. Oh my God, what am I gonna do? I'm like, these bangs are like pretty integral to the look, right? So I'm freaking out. And he's not coming. So I start yelling, Gary, Gary. So he comes up and and I'm in the bathroom and I'm, you know, I've got this brush in my head. And I'm sweating profusely and he, I'm pulling it. And he thought I was joking. And then as soon as he discovered that I was actually serious about this, and I had this brush stuck in my hair, <laughs> he bent over, no sound, no breathing. He was laughing so <laughs> hard. And look, I knew it was hysterical. I knew it was hysterically funny, but at that moment, I, <laughs> It was not crew. funny. Yeah. So I just after I just said, <laughs> I gotta cut the brush out. Oh no! So, so the hair was like a centimeter long from here to here, <laughs> and I had to do a really bad comb over. And they show up, and God bless her, she was so professional. I said, "You may as well go home." She said, "Why?" I said, "I had a hair accident." Oh, no. She looks at my hair, and she goes, "Oh yeah." I thought something looked different. Oh, no. <laughs> We're doing this audition. I'm like, oh my God, mortified. Okay. So later that night, I told my sister and she said, and I got the job. I used for I, property. I, and I read that part of the book. She said, they gave you the job anyway. I'm like, yeah, I guess, I don't know. So, I, oh my God, one of my worst moments. I kept that brush, David, with the hair. There was at least six inches of hair in there. I kept it until last year. Okay. So hold on then. I'm going to go, I'm going to, I'm going to parlay this for us. Okay. All right. Because this, this leads into the whole thing about, you know, personal beliefs and, and making up stories and imagining what could be, or in, you know, maybe just instead of rolling with it or even bringing it to life. But let's talk about that for a second. Cause again, the book talks about it and, and very much, this is a very similar scenario there where here you are, missing this so-called integral part of the the do which and I, I don't even say that joke i get it right but these limiting beliefs that hold us back and and how much power that they have to control our thoughts and and and, and our actions and how we do things oh, yeah. how do we get past how did you get past how do we get past this this way of limiting ourselves to really go beyond our comfort zone because look we've got people that will not come on a zoom meeting when we do a zoom a collective zoom because, hey, fine, maybe you're scrolling Facebook or maybe you're multitasking. Maybe you're not really there. You just signed in. But there are others who go, I just don't like the way I look. I don't like the way I sound. And they're not even the ones talking or presenting. I know. Yet here you are about to literally go for a television interview for a show, which you probably only get one, one, like one, one sort of chance at this audition. You realize that part of your front of your hair is gone. They recognize it. They even say it. And they're like, okay, action. Go ahead. I know, <laughs> but, but, but seriously, it, it takes, it takes uh, a lot of strength, a lot of strength and willpower to get past that and say, you know what? I'm going to be who I am. How did you do that? You know, as a younger person, uh, I'm not sure how I would have handled it. I think I had more confidence than I give myself credit for than I remember. Well, there's a question. But, how, how do we become more confident then maybe? maybe yeah. That's the question, right? Yeah. And, and. I'd like to say experience, but there are ways to become more confident. For example, you've got to find a way to tap into who you really are. I don't care who you are, no matter what role you're playing, because we play all kinds of roles. We've got all kinds of labels, daughter, mother, sister, teacher, employer, um, girlfriend, whatever our labels are, uh, whatever religion we are, whatever... Uh, all these other labels that we give ourselves, but really like, who are we? Who am I? What do I want? And this is so difficult. When I started real estate, I was, you know, in my early thirties and I was asking myself, what do I want to be when I grow up? Cause I had gone through a lot The you know, the company that I had been working for, they closed down during that recession. And, you know, uh, so I didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up. That was really hard. That was 
I'm not going to say the first time in my life that I actually sat down and asked myself, what do I really want? Because now I was free. I had no constraints. I didn't have anybody, didn't have anybody to tell me what I should do or how I should do it. Now I had free will. We're, we're born with free will, but somehow we give up our power and we become slaves to whatever labels we allow people to put on us. Not that they put them on us. We take on the label. We believe the label. So you got to get rid of the labels. And you've got to determine who you are. So that's where the awareness comes in, right? Then, like then when you're calm and you, you, you have this inner strength that is so powerful, it's just that we shut it up all the time. We don't pay attention to it. When you can tap into that, then you're confident. You don't need confidence. Confidence doesn't even exist. You are who you are and you're true to that. And what I learned over the years, David, was when I feel things in my solar plexus, so when I learned to listen to that feeling, to listen to the physiological reaction that I'm having, anytime I didn't pay attention to it or I went against it, it didn't work out. It was either a disaster or just mildly not good for me, right? So every time I've listened to my gut, that's where I feel it. Everybody's different. You might feel it in your head, wherever. You might get a sore knee, I don't know. When you feel it, act on it, then know that it, it is aligned with you. It is aligned with you and your true self. So what, what, what if you want it so bad and you have that feeling, but you can't decipher the feeling? Is it saying go for it or is it saying don't go for it? Ah, well, then that's where you have to get into that place where you're focused on what your goal is, the, the thing that you want so badly. There you go. And then see how you feel then. That's the thing. Because there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of noise outside. And there's a lot of noise inside. So you do have to be able to understand. When I focus on this, how do I feel? If it makes you happy, if it feels good, then that's the thing. But here's the thing, David. When you're going after this thing, it may not be smooth sailing. Right? So then you're like second guessing yourself. Maybe, I, maybe it was don't do it. No, no, no know yourself, become aware, shed light on all of those false beliefs. What do you think? Then shed light on it. Why do you think that way? Well, because I grew up in a family that thought that way. They probably never said to you, and this is what I used to think. I used to think they never said to you, Sandra, you can't do that. But I felt that I couldn't do it because it wasn't done in the family. I worked with a woman who, uh, she was in her thirties, late thirties. And she wanted to buy her own place, but she hadn't told her parents. She still lived at home. It was in their culture. That's what you do. And I, I understand that Mediterranean parents, right? I understand that. Mm -hmm. She was afraid to tell them that she was going to buy her own place. Be she was afraid for the backlash because she thought they would try to stop her. So she never told them. And that in itself stopped her. So she never moved forward with her dream of owning her own place because of the perceived of what she believe. thought was going to happen. Right. But she knew she wanted it. So had she taken the step and taking action, it doesn't matter all the goals in the world. If you don't take action, those small little, you said the how to the little small yeah. step, right. Turn left. If you don't take action. You're not going to go anywhere. So speaking of taking action, um, I know that uh, over the years you have built this, this real estate career of yours into this full fledged empire um, and, and with a lot of moving parts that, that come with it. And, uh, you just, just opened, like, I don't know when today, yesterday kind of thing, but just opened your brokerage. Um, let's tell everybody more about that. Uh, cause I'm sure there's a whole bunch of people that are, are sort of tuning in going, I, I like this lady. Um, <laughs> but, but, but tell me this, uh, tell us more about the broker for a moment, you know, sure. uh, make the announcement by all means. Um, and, and then let's go there for a sec. How did you know that it was the right time and i think you might have just told us that answer but yeah tell, you know is this something other people should consider too i mean should they think about that um and if not opening a brokerage maybe starting a team what are your thoughts on all this i mean as you share this yeah. this announcement with us yeah so i'm proud to announce that we have aligned with the voice of canadian real estate royal lepage terra equity renomado we opened essentially yesterday <laughs> So I'm really happy. Thank you, David, for allowing me to mention where we are. Thanks. We're still in the same location, right? In High Park, 1820 Bloor. Um, what made the decision for me, you know, we're going to go back to this whole manifesting thing. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's our lives. Okay. We create our destinies, right? So 
Uh, you know, David, I like to have a hand in every pot. I was writing a book, starting a course, right, training right. agents, <laughs> selling real estate, doing whatever else I'm doing. And I realized I needed to focus on the brokerage. So my husband, Gary, he took over the selling in, uh, of real estate for both of us. And I that allowed me the time to focus just on the brokerage. And what happens is all these pieces to this multi-puzzle, a uh, multi-piece puzzle come together. And one thing after another led me to make the move. Now, what's really interesting is when the, you know, I'm going to get a little woo, -woo, woo out there, but when the universe gives you a sign, and you're not paying attention. We could call it all the woo woo we want. I'm a believer. Awesome. You, it's going to give you another sign, but this sign isn't going to be the little, Hey, it's going to be like a, Hey, <laughs> and then it's going to be, you know, Hey, it's going <laughs> to smack you upside the head until you listen and it will force your hand. So it wasn't definitely wasn't at the forced hand yet, but it was becoming a stronger and stronger and clear message. And I truly believe it's because I started to focus on the brokerage and things started to align um, with my goal for the brokerage. Is it right for everyone? I'll tell you something, uh, just like the real estate industry, it's not easy, but ask yourself why you want to do it. Why do you want to do it? Honestly, I was driving to work the other day and I had listened to something or read something the day before mm -hmm. and then had gone to bed. And, and it said, you know, if you didn't have to work, would you still do the job you're doing? And the honest answer was, hell yeah. I love this. I love being able to focus on this. I love helping my agents. I love answering the questions. I love growing the business. I love everything I'm doing. So I, 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 my sister said, well, you're really lucky. You're really blessed. And I'm like, am I, or did I create that? I believe we create that. Sure. There were a lot of mistakes along the line. There were a lot of unhappy days and then years and months and whatever along the line. But then when you click onto something, just be aware. It was like, it dawned on me. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so happy. I mean, I do that anyway. I'm a happy person. And I'm just like, I'm just buzzing with happiness, you know, the joy, the bliss. It could, for me, it was always something as simple as seeing a, a mare with her foal and the foals kicking up his feet in the meadow. That would make me so happy, but I could go there in my mind anytime I wanted to be happy. It's like you create your own happiness, right? You're responsible for your own happiness. You and I can, or we, you, you and I are very similar, but you could take two people seeing the same thing. And one person will say, oh my gosh, that's so beautiful. I'm so happy. It brings a tear of happiness to my face. And the other guy's going, that's brutal yeah, for yeah. whatever reason. So your perception, that's the lens that you see the world through, right? It doesn't matter what the exter external circumstances are to a certain extent. It doesn't matter. It's how are you perceiving it? How are you translating that data? How are you deciphering that data for yourself? It, it's all choices. And I'm actually going to circle back to that in a second, but it's on the topic of the brokerage for a moment and just Sandra in the real estate world. I want to rapid fire a couple of questions here. Yeah. One, where does most of your business come from? People, you know, or people you don't know over the, the duration of your career? Uh, people I know. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of marketing channels, I imagine you're, you're I mean, TV was obviously a help, but just a piece of, uh, there's obviously a lot of other things that you do for marketing, but in a nutshell, are you leveraging social media? Oh yeah. Are you, is it more about the organic and connecting with people? Is it more about the spending? It, it, no, it's about, it's about organic. I have to be authentic. I had to be authentic on TV. That's why it resonated with people. If it had been scripted and somebody else telling me what to say, I couldn't do it anyways. I'm not an actor. So and, and, you're sharing your voice rather than somebody else sharing your that's voice. Right. Okay, that's cool. Right. And that's that's obviously working out. Uh, digital advertising. Are you a believer in, in sort of the whole pay for the online lead thing? Or is this more about, again, work your network? Or maybe I do. both at this point? I, I'd say both. Absolutely. Okay. Both yeah. are important. Cool. Okay. Um, now, on that then, uh, if we said, you know, we've, we've, you know, we've talked a lot about um, mindset and you know, I know we've got a big message uh, specifically geared around, you know, even empowering women. Uh, but I know also that as I was going through the book, a lot of that is just applicable to just anybody in a, a general sense. It's very applicable to everybody. But, you know, what overall advice do you have anybody uh, for anybody here that's that's, you know, in the industry trying to make a name for themselves? In real estate? Yeah. Uh, definitely find the joy in the job because that's who you are. 
it'll resonate not only with you and make you happy to get out of bed every morning and, you know, jump in your car in February when it's dark at 4.30 and it's black <laughs> ice and you have your family at the dinner table, uh, but it'll also resonate with your clients. And you know what? You're never going to bat a thousand. You're never going to... Um, you're never going to be the realtor that everybody needs. You are going to find clients that don't like the way you work. Let it go. Mm -hmm. We're humans. Something they want something different. And David could go back to one of your first comments, which was, you know, maybe they just want the guy to put the key in the door and write up the deal for them. Yep. No, no. Right. So whatever it is, or, and, and here's another thing. If you don't trust your client or if your client, your client doesn't trust you, that is an uphill battle that nobody ever wins. Don't waste your energy on that. As a realtor, you don't get paid until the client buys or sells a property, right? So if it's an uphill battle and you've wasted all this energy and at the end of the day, they just don't trust you enough to continue with you, why would you do that? You get to pick your own clients. You're not obligated to work with anyone. And this is life. Don't do anything out of a sense of duty because that's, dr that's slavery. You're if they're not your people, understand that they are not your people, right? Yeah, right? exactly. Um, you offer a course. I noticed that as well. I know you talked about it. Um, tell us more about that just for, for anybody here. If it's applicable yeah. to the audience, feel free, please. Uh, I know that, um, you know, well, share that with us. So what's the course about very quickly? So the course, when I wrote the book, yeah. I realized that it, it, it went from, it could easily go from self-help to shelf help. You know, you put it on the shelf. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Maybe yeah, never okay. read it. Yeah, Maybe yeah. just read the first paragraph. I don't know. I've got a lot of those books. So I also know having worked closely with, and I, I specifically targeted women for this book because, um, I think with marketing, sometimes you have to call out the target demographics name. It's like, Hey, you single woman. Hey, you Shelly, you know, well, we know with marketing, you're always, a, you, your first step is figuring out your niche. Who's your audience. Yes. Absolutely. So I niched it right down, but you're right. It's applicable, uh, applicable to everybody, but I can speak as a woman who had false beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I wrote about, but it is something that everyone could learn from. But if you're just going to read the book once and not do the work, it's not going to work. If you're not even going to read the book or just read, as I said, a paragraph, it's not going to work. I know that people need more help. So I created different levels of the program, the course, so that you could get anything from just watching re recordings to actually having me, having me on speed dial and say, oh my gosh, Sandra, what do I do? Because the lessons you learn in the course, in the book can be applied to all aspects of your life. It's not just to buy a house, okay? I know that, you know, sometimes we think this obstacle is insurmountable and we've made up that obstacle in our minds. So as soon as you shed light on it, you go, well, that's pretty stupid. I mean, I've had that myself. It's like, well, that's stupid. You've already dealt with that once, twice, three times. Why would it be a problem now? Get rid of it. And then you have clear air in front of you, right? So we build these obstacles. So the, the, the tools, the skills, the confidence, knowing yourself, knowing what you want, knowing how to tap into what you want, all of that will, you know, fuel you for the rest of your life. And you know this, David, it's daily work for the rest of your life because you turn your back on that garden. Guess what? The weeds grow. And before you know it, if you don't go back and tend that garden, it's just going to be a garden filled with weeds. And the weeds, of course, are your false beliefs. I like, I like, I like that reference to the garden. I, I actually, I don't know that I've heard that one before, but it is so logical. Um, great way to spin that. And in fact, there was another reference um, in the book that you use, in fact, to uh, the movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, um, that said, and I will quote it, when you are successful, you become the sign of hope of the optimist, but to the pessimist, you represent the stink of his own failure. Exactly. Let's, and I, I mentioned a moment ago, I want to go back to choices here. Um, let's talk choices and how they affect our outcome. Well, you make choices all day long. You make choices almost every minute of every day, right? And they affect you. There's consequences with every choice. Sometimes they're brilliant consequences. Sometimes not so much. And sometimes they're not an issue, right? Like what you're going to order at the restaurant. Sometimes people deliberate over this and then they, they have food envy. They're like, oh, I knew I should have ordered that other one, right? So um, back to that quote for a second, mm -hmm. that was really, really eye-opening for me. Um, I had a, a, 
they sent a coach when I first started on Property Virgins. They sent a, a, a talent coach, uh, it, and all he did was he filmed me on camera, and I was completely natural, like I am right now. You can't you can't hold me down. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, just don't change anything. What do you want to talk about? I'm like, oh, okay. So I said, I'm going on to TV. What should I expect? And you know what he said to me? He said, people around you are going to change. People, I said, really? He says, yeah. And I'm talking people very close to you are going to change, and they're going to say you changed but you're probably not going to change. So it's going to be them and it's going to be them. They're either going to be really excited for your success, right? Mm -hmm. So for the optimist, it's going to be like the beacon of hope or it's going to remind them of their own failure because they're judging. People are judging themselves against you. They're using you as a benchmark. It's like, what? Sandra is superior to me now. Now I feel inferior. I want to feel superior to her. Or I just like it when everybody's just mediocre. Mediocrity is the name of the game, right? We're taught mediocrity from day one in school. Sorry, I shouldn't blame the school system. It's society that teaches us mediocrity. Um, and so it's them. It's not you, it's them is, is really the truth. It's, and, and he said, and shortly after that, I went to a holiday party and somebody that I've known since I was 16 was talking to me and he was like, yeah, you know, I don't have a mortgage and well, I don't have to work. And, I don't know. and I'm like, why is this guy talking like that's gross? First of all, we never talk about that stuff. And, and I started to realize I was making him feel bad about his life. And their story after story, I write about them in the book. And thank you for reading the book, by the way. Thank but you for I sending the book, right, by the way. <laughs> I, was, I was very happy to see that. Um, and it's just, you know, other people's agenda should have zero effect on you. And that's where you have to go inside. Okay, wait. So then how do we stop ourselves from thinking like a victim to mm -hmm. overcome those obstacles? Because you've got to take responsibility for yourself. And how do you do that? You have to become aware of what you think, how you think, your choices you're making, why you're, why did you make that choice? What's important to you? I have people that want to buy, you know, far, far away because they want that three car garage and the this and the that. And I'm like, but you work, it's going to take you an hour and a half to get to work. And then God forbid there's a snowstorm or rain, you know, <laughs> and they say, no, no, it's for the kids and the three car garage and everything. And then they're miserable because they're spending 15, 20 hours a week traveling to work so how's that helping the kids now you know how's that working out for you now you, you, you're losing at least 10 hours that you could have been spending with your kids so how does that work out so it's the choice that you make what's driving that choice like I, when people used to say well it doesn't have the stainless steel appliances that really threw me for a loop like you can go to leon's or wherever i shouldn't say mm -hmm. brand name but mm -hmm. you know you can go anywhere and buy stainless steel appliances if it's not this year it's next year you put it you make a new goal for yourself and the the thing is they didn't feel that other people would like their choice, appreciate the choice they made if it didn't have stainless steel. I'm like, you're buying real estate? Are you kidding me? The last five years in real estate in Toronto, people doubled their home values, sometimes more than doubled their home. So if you did buy for 500,000 five years ago, now it's worth roughly a million bucks. And if that was your principal res, that profit, that equity is tax-free. Oh my gosh, if that's not wealth building. So what are you worried about stupid appliances for? Well, okay, so what if I make a mistake? I'm worried about making a mistake. And that's what everybody's worried about. Are we allowed? Are we allowed? That's what everybody's worried about. Right. So that goes back to your gut feeling or wherever you feel it. Doesn't make you happy. And I've often said this to clients, especially buyers. When you come home after working and you walk into your space, after you've decorated it and made it your little nest, are you? how are you going to feel? Just visualize how you will feel for a minute and they're like yeah i'm and gonna be that happy. ultimate feeling right there that moment is 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 everything you've wanted yeah then it, the rest of it doesn't matter go for it the problem is though sometimes people want a laundry list of stuff that just isn't feasible right now and that laundry list of stuff like stainless steel's appliances i'm sorry i'm beating up on them right now is not essential to your happiness let's get a grip that is not essential to your happiness what are the reasons why you're buying real estate or selling real estate? Is the stainless steel fridge going to make a difference? What are the reasons why you want to buy real estate? And I do a seven levels deep when I can. It's that seven levels deep why exercise. Because the reason why, I don't know how much time we have left, but like if, if somebody says to me, I want to buy a house with a backyard and I go, oh, that's cool. Yeah, sure. That makes sense. Why? Because I want to get a dog. Oh, I love dogs. I totally get that. 
And we often, as the realtor, we assume we know why they want that. Mm -hmm. But if you start digging down and then you find out that they came from a different city and everybody told them they couldn't live in Toronto, it's too expensive and you're going to fail and that job that you're moving for probably isn't going to pan out and you're not smart enough, you're not rich enough, you're not young enough, you're not old enough, whatever it is, they always have something to say that you're not something enough, just fill in the blanks. And you did it anyways, but now you're starting to feel a little bit lonely and you're starting to waver on your commitment to yourself, which is your career, okay? But you know that if you had that dog, that would be your buddy because you grew up with a dog and this is your companion. You can go running late at night and feel safe. Somebody's there to welcome you at home and it gives you a reason to get up in the morning and go to High Park or wherever you're going. And uh, you would feel really good about that. And you know, you've made some friends here. Pandemic was hard. Uh, people at, at work are, they're okay, but they're kind of weird. <laughs> And you can't develop those relationships that you had back home because they're lifelong friends. They're your family. You're here alone. So all of those reasons are why you want a home with a backyard. That's very different than I want to get a dog. And that understanding of yourself and me understanding your driving factor is going to help you get to your goal faster and eliminate, go over, around, burst through those obstacles that are going to come up because they're going to come up right? No matter how much planning you've done and how secure you are, there's no, I'm ready to go. There's going to be something that's going to present as an obstacle because that's how you're perceiving it. But if you can tap into the real reason why you want that home with a backyard or whatever it is on your list, then you'll get it. You'll find a way to get it. And as we said earlier, may not look exactly like what you're thinking, but it'll probably be better. You know, and the learning moment on that, I mean, or, or one of the learning moments on that, uh, and this goes on both sides. If you're the one making the decision for yourself, ask yourself the open-ended questions. If you're the one, the realtor on the other side, and you're helping somebody figure it out, ask the open-ended questions. That, that mm -hmm. question of why, you know, tell me more, how. So, you know, what would you feel? Get people talking, and this will get, that'll get to the depths of what we're trying to achieve. Um, speaking of achieve. And I, I, I'm, I'm watching the clock there. Uh, a couple questions here, but, but one of my favorites. How do you know it's been a successful day for you? Yeah, well, I had moments of joy or a whole day of joy. And the joy could come from seeing a smile on someone's face like you just smiled. <laughs> because I know I did a good job for you. Like, not you, David, but I know if you're oh, my you did a phenomenal. It's been amazing. <laughs> or my, one of my agents in my office, I know I resolved a problem. I love solving problems. Oh my gosh. I live for solving problems. Okay. Except for the hair and the brush, but, um, Hey, you solved it. <laughs> Shoot, uh, yeah. it off and get downstairs on time. <laughs> and somebody gave me just, just in case that ever happens to you people get a set of pliers and pull out the, the parts of the brush that are sticking out. Anyway, um, if I helped someone, even, you know, I remember a long, long time ago, I put parking meter, I fed the meter and I was like dressed up and I came out and I was on the sidewalk and there was this old man, he was hunched over with his walker and he was looking down at the ground and I said, good morning, sir. And he looked up and he saw this woman saying good morning to him and he like instantly stood up and he's like, good morning, good morning. You know, it's 20 years later and I still remember that it was more important for me than him probably, but I'm sure I made his morning, right? So just something as simple as that, people just live in joy, share the joy. You know, I, uh, I coach my baseball team and I tell, I tell my team because they're 10 year olds that a good batting average in baseball is 300. That's like a really good batting average, which means you hit three out of 10 baseballs. Yeah. And we've got to prep these guys, right? Because they're just getting to pitching for the first time. In fact, they play their first official game tonight, um, exhibition, but they're pitching for the first time. It's a whole cool. new world for these guys. And there's going to be a lot of disappointment around not getting the strikeouts and, and uh, you know, not hitting the ball. But again, we explain these percentages. And I bring up the percentage for a reason. Um, everybody who listens to this show on a regular basis, I'm going to share this with you as well. I have asked that question about what, you know, um, how do you know it's successful, a successful day for you um, in baseball, maybe a good batting average is three out of 10, but we right now are batting a thousand. Okay. We are batting a thousand. We are, are 10 out of 10 or 20 out of 20 or 50 out of 50. I don't know how many times I've asked that question. Not one person has ever answered it by saying they made money 
or they, they, they won or they achieved. They always talk about help. They always talk about joy for others. They always talk about what they were able to do for other people. And I just, I, Sandra, I want you to know that. And That's I want awesome. everybody else who maybe hasn't heard me ask that question before, understand that the most successful people that I have spoken to, listened to, learned from, read about, it was the same answer. They could have all the money in the world. Yeah. Money is never why they are successful. Yeah. And so That's awesome. I just thought I'd share that with you. Um, two last questions for you here. One of them. Last words, tips uh, for anybody tuned in. Um, and I'll, I'll lump into that. You know, if you could, if you could impact change in this industry today with one message in a, in a short way, and, and let me preface this by saying, I think that the last, you know, 55 minutes or so together today, um, we went deep. We, we didn't talk uh, a ton of marketing around real estate, which is one of my favorite topics. And I, your book was a catalyst to that. I just, I loved a lot of the content that was in there. And, and when we look at the fact that, yeah, here we are literally in the final day of the first half of our year. Yeah, we're going to the back half. So the, a lot of the mindset stuff in my mind is, is absolutely imperative to share with people. Um, but some final words, you know, some, some maybe, maybe something that, that just everybody can resonate with as we, uh, we, we take off today. As a realtor, I think it's crucial that everyone that holds a license understands that you are affecting lives. We're not performing surgery, okay? Heart surgery, brain surgery. But if you do a bad job or a lackadaisical, take a lackadaisical approach because you're not connected to the joy in the job, because you're not connected to the real reason why you're doing it, then you could mess up someone's life. This is a serious gig, serious. And your clients have to understand how serious it is as well. So please understand that we are affecting lives, even if it's just minuscule. But I learned that after about a year and a half in the job, because I wasn't really that intrigued with real estate anymore after a year and a half. And a friend said to me, what is it you want to do? I said, I don't know, but I just want to help people. And she said, you're missing the boat. You are helping people get to the next stage of their lives and they need you to get there. And the next time I went on a showing, I turned around and she's crying. She's oh my God, we found our house. We could start our family now. And I went, wow. And that's when I found the joy. So please understand that, you know, take your job seriously. Please do a good job for people. That's what they rely on us as professionals. And that, in, and that also means working on your mindset, but also learning your craft, hone your craft constantly. 25 years in the biz, I'm still constantly taking courses and learning from my interactions from people. Wicked powerful message. Sandra, where can people connect with you? Where can they get the book? Where can they learn about the course? Where can they find out how to maybe work with you? Renomato.com, R-I-N-O-M-A-T-O.com or 416-565-3001. Screaming it. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, thank you, Sandra. This has been uh, another amazing, amazing show. Uh, just a a conversation, though, for me, when we get into the depths around mindset and, and, and uh, intention setting and manifesting, goal setting choices, you know, um, I think we went deep today. And I, uh, I, I want to thank you again for all the amazing insights. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Obviously, I love to talk <laughs> and to talk to someone like you, David, who understands and, and teaches this stuff. I think that's brilliant. A, a great opportunity for me. And I had a lot of fun. Thank you so much. And I came on the camera, people, even with my COVID hair. So chill out. Just don't worry about it. Do what you got. If you have a voice and you have a message, just get on camera. And I've got to sometimes listen to my own words. So thanks, David. You're either listening to us uh, on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify. Maybe you're watching us live. Maybe you went to my website, mindshare101.com. And while you're on my site, make sure to download your free copy, The Ultimate Marketing Bundle for Realtors. This is a 31-page ebook packed with a ton of marketing sales tips and tricks. Plus, there's a ready-to-go 90-day social media content calendar for you to, uh, well, help you build that mind share so that you can get more market share. Also, if you want to talk personalized one-to-one -one coaching, 
to help you get to your next level, just get in touch with me. We'll set up a free consultation call, learn more about what, well, you're looking to achieve and how I and my team will help you do just that. Also, please don't forget that our push to 100 is on. We are trying to get to 100 reviews on iTunes. And so uh, I want to encourage you. I want to ask you very kindly, please go to iTunes, um, subscribe to the show, give us a big five-star rating, leave a nice review, tell us how much you love it, tell everybody else how much you love it. And uh, once again, thank you in advance for that. If we haven't yet, let's connect on Facebook at Mindshare 101. David Greenspan, your real estate industry coach. uh, And on Instagram at David Greenspan 101. I want to once again thank Virginia Munden and the Buzz Conference for sponsoring today's episode. Make sure you connect with the Buzz Conference by visiting their website, www.thebuzzconference.com and by following them on Instagram at the Buzz Conference to keep tabs on all of the awesome events that they are always hosting. I also want to thank Kids Keep In Touch Systems for sponsoring today's episode. If you haven't checked us out yet, just go to mindshare101.com and click on marketing. This has been another episode of the Mindshare Podcast. Thank you for tuning in.